So uh, this is an irrigation basics training session. I notice you guys are from quite different business uh, units, all of you, um, and I'll hopefully be able to cover off uh, enough of each thing, especially from the golf standpoint. Like uh, this is kind of a very, very kind of, it's not golf, <laughs> but I don't know what the intention was. Were you given some kind of like, make sure you come back and you know heaps of stuff or just, no just go sit down and learn? Yeah. All right, cool. So uh, we do an, an advanced irrigation training session, which we've done recently. We've done this basics training session a fair bit. Uh, I've written that, I guess it's a guide. Uh, I'll try to stick to that as best as possible. The, because this is our new location, we don't have as much gear here. So I've kind of got as much as I can. Up here are the social handles for the three businesses that I own and me. If you guys are interested to follow what we're doing, that's the same for Instagram. YouTube, Facebook, LinkedIn, and so on. This is one of our three locations. This is our newest location. None of you would have been here before because we've only been here for a month. We've got a location in Kent Town, which is Water Pro's first shop, which some of you have probably been to, and then obviously some of you are from down south. You would have traveled some distance to get here, yep. Um, so we've got uh, Railways Landscape Supplies at Renella as well. So uh, all three locations are irrigation shops. This will be the strongest stopped shop, and then Railways will probably be um, as much as it's a landscape supplies yard, we are making it a point for it to be a, a strong irrigation shop in its own right, so you'll be able to go down there and buy irrigation if you need to. Obviously, we deliver across the country every day as well, so um, we try to encourage our clients to use our delivery service where possible because it saves you guys leaving site, and obviously, if you're in a car, you're not making money. So, uh, The company, WaterPro itself, I started in 09 with a business partner. It's now 13 years old and obviously we bought railways 18 months ago and started Lawn Hub, which is a fertilizer brand three or four, three years ago. Uh, we now have, I think, 33 or 32 staff across the three locations. Uh, railways is open seven days a week and the other stores are only five and a half. So, irrigation in its most basic form uh, is, is what we'll be touching on today. Uh, if you look into, your, into that booklet, it talks about the tools that you would need to do irrigation at its most basic. It's one of those trades that you can really set yourself up quite um, inexpensively just by having something to cut pipe with and something to close clamps with if you're just doing residential uh, drip or pop-up sprinkler systems. These are a, a cutter that you've probably all seen that most irrigation shops stock and we stock. I like these cutters. I prefer to use these over secateurs. They give a cleaner cut. These cutters will also cut PVC pipe and little tree branches and cable. So if I was installing, I'd be cutting my cable with this as much as it probably destroys the blades. We've had the same cutters at Waterpro at Kent Town for the whole time we've been there, and you can just replace the blade. So you can set yourself up pretty inexpensively. Uh, obviously, you probably have all these tools already, and then you won't need a drill bit like that in your drill for irrigation, but having a drill to be able to mount irrigation controllers or to uh, tr troubleshoot solenoid valves will be beneficial. And then one of the other tools that I'd recommend you have is some kind of wire stripper if you're gonna be wiring up solenoid valves. Uh, some would argue that you don't need to strip wires when you're using these because they've got metal inside them that's designed to pierce the wire. I find that it doesn't always work. Um, so if you are using wire joiners like these, just make sure that there's no metal actually coming outside of the gel and then your wire joins will be waterproof and, and safe. Uh, this, the licensing side of things with irrigation is probably something that's become more prevalent now with um, associations like the Master Landscapers Association and the Irrigation Association getting out there and actively lobbying for trades to be licensed and for um, unlicensed trades to be chased and prosecuted. So I just put that in there just to make sure that you're aware that there will be licensing uh, requirements, especially, well definitely for the landscaping side of things, but then there are some licensing requirements if you're doing main, mains water irrigation connections and master valves. So I, I'm pretty sure uh, from an irrigation standpoint, everything after a master valve, you don't need a license to do for anything under 25 mil. So if you're doing residential stuff, you're fine. Obviously what you guys are doing on a golf course, if you're doing work on kind of 80 mil main lines or 100 mil main lines, it's very likely that you need an irrigation license to be doing it. Obviously that's something for your superiors to, to deal with. Uh, there's a guy that I did a podcast with recently called Sam Cattell who is um, SA Trade Licensing. If anyone does need any help, I don't have any financial affiliation with him. He's just a good dude. Um, he helps people get their builders licenses. He used to work for 
the Office of Consumer and Business Affairs and he now has a business where he'll help you get your builder's licence. Um, he'll do a mock interview with you, help you fill out your paperwork and get you ready for an interview. Obviously, that gives you that kind of more comfortable, smooth transition to going into your interview and hopefully getting your licence. Backflow protection is something that a lot of people overlook. Uh, <clears throat> they say water take it quite seriously and I'm not sure if any of you are, were around in the days of um, putting Trefland chemicals through drip tube to stop root intrusion when drip tube was going nuts back in 06. But back then you needed to use two RPZs to protect your water from poten potential contamination. The, the chemical Treflan um, is not something that they want people drinking and they don't want it in, in the um, water source. So they wanted an RPZ which is your highest level of protection. This is a dual check which is your lowest level of protection. It's just two spring loaded check valves that sit inside of it. This is what they use for residential backflow prevention. And there's just these two, it's not gonna work, spring-loaded uh, white plastic non-return valve. So the water can only go one way through those. So it goes through two of them. And the theory is that uh, it doesn't go backwards. And then if there's any breakages in your irrigation system, uh, and it can have like a venturi effect where it sucks water back into your system. It's not going to suck any dirt or, you know, animal feces or fertilizer back into the drinking supply and obviously protect your home uh, or your workplace and the people around you. So if you're not sure about any of the backflow requirements, uh, most of it's the information is available on the internet. And alternatively, obviously, I've got a team of people that can help you with that. Uh, if you're doing, especially like new home packages like some of you do um, you might be putting tap timers on garden taps they technically require a backflow prevention device uh, as a protection of the to the mains the backflow prevention devices that go on a tap are, are small little brass one-way spring and you just screw that straight onto the tap and then put your tap timer straight on that and it protects your drinking water supply so that's probably one of the these are one of the things that we don't see people buying as much, and I say buying, like it's, it sounds like an upsell because obviously it's another $40 that you've got to add to your system. Um, it's, it's legislated. So if you haven't been putting backflows in uh, and you haven't been caught yet, you, you know, you might never get caught, but it's just a good practice to get into. It's doing it the right way, which if you're here to learn about irrigation, the company you work for or the company that you own, you obviously want to do things the right way. Otherwise you wouldn't be here learning about it. So I encourage you to keep your eye on those um, and put backflows in when they are required. Uh, where are we? So commercially, a lot of the backflow stuff, so if you do a commercial um, irrigation system, a lot of the time the builder will cover the backflow and then it'll be in your tender documents. I don't know how many of you guys are doing commercial irrigation systems. Is that, you know, if you did a warehouse or? No, not, not yet. Yeah. So if it comes up, a lot of times it'll say the backflow will be by the builder or the plumber and then obviously you can just exclude it, but you just want to make sure that it's there. <coughs> so irrigation uh, is obviously the, the delivery of water through plastic that you can buy at an irrigation shop um, in its kind of most basic form. All of the products that we supply at all of our locations are supplied through professional manufacturers. So we choose to work with the likes of Rainbird and Hunter and Toro and Netafem and Iplex and I don't want to leave any out because I'm filming this. On that as well, I, we film all the training sessions. If, you got, if any of you are concerned about being in that or the back of your head being in a video, just let me know. I'll get Duffy to move the camera or make sure you're not in it. Um, obviously there's evidence of the fact that you were here. Um, if that's required, we've got that as well. Um, so yeah, with the... We choose to buy through professional irrigation manufacturers for a few reasons. Um, one of them, obviously, we've got a stable supply of irrigation, even off the back of uh, the recent world events with shipping becoming um, or harder for us to get, or harder for a lot of industries to get products into their warehouses and their shops. We haven't had any issues so far with our supply. This new warehouse was part of my strategic plan to make sure that we kind of double protected ourselves. We can hold three months worth of stock here now so that we've always got a bit of a, a head start on any global shortages. Um, the other side of it is that most of the products have been tested uh, in you know, wind tunnels or they've been tested in trials to, to better understand what the irrigation is doing when it's being impacted by wind or also to make sure that the products are um, just delivering what they, they, they say that they're delivering. So when we design an irrigation system, 
we know how much water we have available and then how much area we need to cover and all the data that we need is taken care of at the manufacturer's level. If you start buying irrigation equipment from hardware shops or from alibaba.com or you know you just slice a hole in a piece of plastic and cross your fingers and it because it sprays that it's throwing out water you can't determine how much water it's actually delivering and then you don't know whether or not you're being efficient with your watering and you also might be overwatering some areas and underwatering other areas so right at the start before we do anything in irrigation we request a flow test from our clients um have you guys done those before yep 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 nope Nope, yep, maybe. So, if you can't get access to a flow versus pressure gauge, the most simple flow test is to get a bucket of some size, nine liters, 10 liters, 20 liters, turn your tap on full, stick your bucket underneath there while it's flowing at its fullest, time how long it takes for that bucket to fill up, and then come back to us with that data. So you, you've got a nine liter bucket and you've filled it up in 18 seconds. We know that you've got 30 liters a minute, or you might have filled it up in nine seconds. We know you've got 60 liters a minute, and that gives us a data point to work from to design your irrigation system. Now, commercially, that's not enough information. When we do a commercial irrigation systems, we require that they give us a flow versus pressure test at a few different set points. I didn't get a, a flow versus pressure gay, uh, tester set up here, but I'm gonna to attempt to draw one. This should be fun. So, when you've got a water source, um, it'll be a bull valve of some variety in the ground. You will then connect your flow versus pressure test. So we've got some pipe there, and then there'll be a T, and then a bull valve there, and then there'll be a gauge on the top of that. So that's the gauge that we've got. Uh, you open this bull valve up, and then you'll adjust this bull valve to let water out and watch this gauge turn. So we would say to someone, look, can you just get us uh, the amount of water you've got flowing per minute at, say, uh, 200 kPa, 300 kPa, and 400 kPa. So they'll adjust the amount of water that's coming out of that gate, uh, out of that bull valve, and try and get the needle to sit where they want it. And once that needle's sitting at say 200 kPa, that's what that's the flow that's coming out at 200 kPa. So then we measure this flow. Now the, we sell a gauge, a digital gauge for that. So there'll be an actual another device on there with a number on it, and that'll it'll it's got a paddle in there and it measures the flow that's going through there. Can you suss if I can get another black? Um, so they set it at 200, 300 and 400. If you've got the, that digital gauge at the end of the device like we do, you just read the number and write it down. So you'll go, all right, we got 200 kPa, we got 20 liters a minute at 300 kPa, we got 22 liters a minute and so on. So then we can create a flow graph to design the irrigation system off of. You could do this without that digital gauge, but then you're timing the bucket again and saying, well, we filled up a nine litre bucket in nine seconds at 200 kPa. We'll also then get a static pressure, so we turn that off and, <coughs> excuse me, measure the pressure that's at the mains when there's no flow, that's the static pressure, so that's important too. Um, you'll find this, the relevance for static pressure, there's a few reasons why it's important. The majority of these, thank you man, the majority of the parts that we sell have a rating, so they can handle a certain amount of pressure. Um, so that's a solenoid valve, bank on a manifold, all of these products before this out, out point have to be rated to mains pressure because when they are closed they're under mains pressure. So the manifold's rated to mains, the solenoid valves are rated to mains and that's where it stops. All the pipe before that is rated to mains. If you don't use mains pressure pipe you know, for all of that, there's a good chance you're going to blow some pipes. Um, the most common times I see that is new subdivisions where a developer has just run poly pipe underneath pavers in a new property and said, there you go, you've got a line there. And then they expect that you run, you're nodding like you've seen this before. <laughs> so they say, well, you just run that 19 mil and just put your manifold out there. You'll be right, man. Like you got, got pipe. That 19 mil is not rated for mains pressure. If you leave that on and then have your manifold at the other end of that, no matter how that manifold is, it can be a manual manifold or, a, or an automatic manifold you are going to have a potential for that to blow out because poly pipe's only rated to 350 kPa. You'll find your static pressures for here it might be six, seven, 800 kPa. When a valve turns off, static spikes, so it might go to 1,000 or 1,200 kPa, you've got problems. So all of the stuff, all of the stuff, I sound like a kid. Everything we sell has a mains pressure rating if it's obviously for mains pressure, so the, these are rated to 1,034 kPa, as are these. A lot of the products that you guys are using on golf courses when you start getting up into your you know, um, Rainbird PESBs and Hunter ICVs, those valves are actually rated to 1600 kPa, because in a lot of cases, 
you've got so much velocity coming through that pipe and then when stuff, stuff again, when things turn off, you'll get a spike and that's when you can have problems with your valves so they just last longer. <clears throat> so we do this flow test and then we start looking at our sketch. So I've given you, this is something that we had drawn up. Um, it's meant to be an A4 fold out kind of thing that we have available on our website for generally for residential clients. So a lot of our business, uh, not a lot of our business, a lot more of our business now than used to comes from uh, people that are on say Facebook uh, communities for lawn or um, any of the YouTube videos that I'm doing and funneling people back to our website and then they're downloading these forms and sending in uh, a scaled plan of the area that they want to have irrigated and then we can obviously do an irrigation design. That same service is available for all of you and it's a free service that we offer for residential properties only. Commercial irrigation design is a whole different thing and that's a charge service and it's a lot different. But we can do a residential irrigation design and prepare you a scale diagram of, of the area, like how the irrigation is going to be laid out. And we can also give you a detailed estimate of what it would cost. So, And we can give you that estimate in your price and then obviously what we would charge if we were to sell that to a retail client so then you've obviously got a good understanding of what the gap is so that you can decide how you want to run your business and set your margins however you want to. So we get the flow, there's a bit of a table there about how the flow works so we've done a table in nine litres, a nine litre bucket to make it easy for you to do. Then you draw your area on the scaled plan, now that scaled, draw, hang on a second, that scaled diagram doesn't have to be on that piece of paper you can do it in CAD, you can draw it on a piece of plasterboard, I don't care how it comes to us. The quality of the design that we give back to you is going to be directly related to the quality of the piece of paper or the plasterboard or whatever you bring to us. Our guys and girls will spend up to five business days preparing the quote and the design and then it will give you something tangible that you can say, alright, this is how much it's going to cost, this is what we're going to get and then this is why we're doing it this way. So we plot the sprinklers out. If you buy the irrigation system from us, you get the design. Um, as a trade client, if you want to look at the design, you're welcome to. It's a, basically a protection mechanism for us to hold the design until you buy the system. So, the things that are, like it's obviously written in this document, <coughs> we need to know everything about the area. So. The area needs to be scaled. We need to know if there's level changes. Um, sprinklers and drippers, uh, as I said earlier, are impacted by the amount of pressure and flow that comes into them. If you have an elevation change, your pressure and your flow changes. So every meter of elevation is 10 kPa of physical pressure going through the system. So if you had a rainwater tank 30 meters above your house, you could run drip tube without a pump. You just open the valve, let the water run down, there's enough physical head. That's how you know town water supplies work with tanks at the top of a hill. So we need to know if there's dramatic level changes. If, you're, if you've got one or two metres over a whole property, it's not really the end of the world. And if you, if you didn't tell us that, there's not going to be big issues. If you had you know, a massive batter, like we've seen, um, where was it, at the, when they built the uh, desalination plant out at Lonsdale, there were so many large hills that they were trying to irrigate with drip tube across the face of the hill. When you have um, elevation changes of more than two metres on one station, all of the water in the bottom drippers will drip out when you turn the system off. They leach out because they still think there's an, well, they're still feeling enough pressure to open. So we need to then design a system slightly differently to make sure that those uh, drippers, when the system turns off, aren't receiving any pressure so they know that they're off. So you can get non-drain drip tube now and there's a lot of technology that's come into our world that wasn't there say 10 years ago and the, the drippers say we'll need 100 kPa to turn on so then we've got that 10 metres of protection but it's just important for us to know. Obviously any paths that we're going to need to cross, that's probably more for you than us. Uh, any, and the, where the water location is, obviously the flow that's coming out of that water location with water locations, it could be a rainwater tank and a pump, but there could also be mains. If you've got a rainwater tank on, uh, on site and you want to use the pump that's attached to that tank, just get us the, the model of the pump and the pipe size that it's sucking through and delivering out of. We can work out the flow for you. Um, while I'm talking about rainwater tanks, it's really important to highlight um, that the majority of homeowners think that they can buy a 2,000 litre rainwater tank and stick it in their house and water their 1,000 square metre block for the all of eternity. It's not the case. This would be very, um, something you guys are really conscious of obviously with, you, you talk about your water security more than most people. 2,000 litre rainwater tank 
going through a normal irrigation system at say 20 litres a minute is going to last 100 minutes and you're going to do a watering cycle of, with say MP rotators of 45 minutes once a week or twice or twice a week so you might be able to well it depends on the size of the area but 2,000 litres doesn't go very far I can go into we go into precipitation a lot more in the advanced irrigation but it's just important for you guys to know and to be conscious of the fact that for someone to be kind of like ultimately secure with their water and not require a mains backup they're going to need 20 30 50 100 thousand liters it's not going to be two or five thousand liters unless they've got a tiny garden bed and that's all they're worried about we can design a system that runs off of mains and rainwater backup we just need to know both options because we would obviously design the system to suit the lowest available flow and pressure and then they can jump between them so Get us all that information, where the lawn is, where the garden is, where you want the controller, where you want the valves, and then we'll go from there. So, is it hot? Do you want me to put fans on? You're all good, it's just because I'm standing around. Probably because I'm overweight, I'm probably just <laughs> hypertension. All right, so obviously there's drip tube, drippers, and spray irrigation are the different options when it comes to, to delivering water to your area. When we design an irrigation system, we're looking at the best system for you, right? So we get lots of questions like, what's better, MP rotators or R vans? Should I put individual drippers in or should I put drip tube in? It really depends on a lot of things. It depends on what the client is looking for. It depends on how much water they've got available. It depends on the size of the area. It depends on, say, how much wind they've got. It depends on how dense the planting is. So we would ask a lot of those questions in the early stages of getting the design brief and then we would help the client decide or we'd decide for them whether or not they're going to use an individual dripper because the area is not very densely planted, if they're going to use drip tube because it is densely planted, if they're going to use drip tube because it will be densely planted later. All of those things matter. Now, once we've designed the system, we can actually determine how many mil per hour is falling on a given square metre. Now this, again, you guys would be looking at your rain gauges daily if it's rained, I guess. Most people don't think about it. Residentially, no one's thinking, well, it, it hasn't rained for a month or like, this month we've received 12 mil of rain but I need to deliver 100 mil a month to my lawn or whatever it might be. That's, this, that's more of an advanced irrigation thing and we'd go into that in the next training but it's just important to highlight that we take that into account when we're designing it and we, we try to work out how much water you're your area is going to need and then we design it so that it's matched so that every square meter of lawn has the same amount of water being delivered to it so if you have a drip system like that's a, a grid of drip tube you've got your header pipe on one side and a collection pipe on the other side so they're both black poly pipes and then you've got drip tube being ran between them equidistant in all areas so all the drippers are 400 apart and then they're 400 apart on the rows what that does is it creates an even grid of watering that enables us to determine how many mil an, a mil an hour is being delivered to this area. And you can do that with drip tube, it's not just a sprinkler thing. If we just zigzag drip tube through a garden bed, we can't determine how many mil we're putting out. We can get an idea of how many litres we're putting out over an area, but the water isn't going to evenly spread itself out through the soil profile. We need to organise that for it. So that's how drip tube works. With sprinklers, it's the same deal. We need to put sprinklers, we need to design sprinklers correctly so that they are watering head to head. Oh, come on. And we're getting match, matched precipitation. So MP rotator, the MP rotator nozzle, the MP stands, stands for matched precipitation. The Rainbird R vans are a matched precipitation nozzle as well. What that means is we can put them in a kind of more loose configuration than we would with a normal spray nozzle and you're going to get match precipitation. So this here from memory says I think 17.6 mil an hour, which is quite high. It's quite a, a high amount of water for a soil profile to take. If that was MP rotators, we'd be getting about 11 mil an hour or, and if it was R vans, we'd be getting about 14 mil an hour. So we designed that so that we, okay, so we've got this many mil an hour going onto these areas and then we work out what, what hap what's happening with it later. So drip tube, dense areas, we can work out how many mil an hour and then we can obviously schedule how long we're going to water for. So you might decide that um, because of the style of plants you've got that you want to put out 25 or say 34, 35 mil an, a week 
of water, you know you're doing 17.6 mil an hour through that system. You can run it for two hours a week, you're gonna get your 35 mil a week, which is gonna give you the right amount of water for the plants that you've put in. And then you adjust that to suit rainfall. So you go, well, we had 10 mil of rain, so we don't need to still put down 35, we can put down 25 because we're just supplementing rain. Yeah? Cool. 17.6 mil an hour is a little bit too much water for most soil profiles to be able to take all at once. So it could be a case that you decide to water for half an hour have a half an hour break or an hour break water for another half an hour, then do that again four days later to try and get the same delivery of water without it just flowing, like flooding off or planing off, especially if you've got a sloped soil profile. So you can do the same thing with individual drippers, but it's gonna cost you a lot more money and it's gonna be a real pain, obviously, punching every one of those drippers in. If you had a more open area, then you could just decide that you're gonna water you know, the large trees are going to have three drippers that do eight litres an hour each and then the smaller trees might have two drippers that do four litres an hour. You can do, you can do that with the drippers that we sell. Um, I'll just show you these drippers here. This is my favourite dripper. I copped a bit of flack for saying, unfortunately, they're made in the United States because some of our YouTube audience is in America, like 70% of it. And I said something negative about America. I do like America. I just prefer to sell Australian-made products in Australia. Uh, this is a Rainbird self-piercing dripper. I'll, actually, I'll put one on each table so you guys aren't coveting each other. So these are a self-piercing dripper that you can punch straight into polypot. The really sharp end is the end that goes into the pipe. And then the other end you can run 4 mil poly from that. So if you wanted to, you could use these drippers to water uh, you know, a kind of more open garden area, or you could water pots with them and have one on each pot. Rainbird make them in a two, four, and eight liter per hour dripper. They come, they're a red, a blue, and a black. I think there are four, I think the red's an eight and the blues are a two. So you could actually get really specific with how you're watering it. You could put a two liter dripper on something that doesn't need much water, and then obviously three fours on something else. Because they're pressure compensating, the, um, because they're pressure compensating, the water that it says is coming out of that dripper, thank you. Sorry guys, I'm gonna drink a Vietnamese iced coffee in front of you. I've recently given up drinking alcohol and um, now I drink them every day and just completely fill myself with sugar at about lunchtime. So the uh, pressure compensating drip tube means that if you've got the right amount of pressure coming into the system, those drippers will deliver the amount of water that they say they're going to deliver. So you can buy a two litre an hour dripper and know that it's putting out two litres an hour. You can buy a four and it gets four and eight and so on. So there you're kind of two different ways of doing drip tube. The drip tube that we sell, so anything you can see in this warehouse, we probably can't, it's all behind you. So all of the purple, all of the brown, any of the drip tube, it's all pressure compensating. The majority of it's a 1.6 litre per hour dripper. Uh, that keeps that, that flow rate down so that we can get this a bit of a lower infiltration rate. Uh, you'll see 2 litre and 2.4 litre an hour drip tube available in the market as well. If you're buying your drip tube from a hardware store, it's very likely that it's not pressure compensating. It won't say it clearly, but it costs less. So not enough less that it, it warrants the change. So we might, it might be 10% less cost and it's efficiency is 10% less. So really, if you, if you have a two litre an hour non-compensating dripper, it might put out 2.2 or 1.8. Like it's not the end of the world. But if you're watering the grapes that they make Grange wine out of, it matters because they need to get down to that accuracy. And the same with your grasses. Like if you're trying to make, how, what is it, 10 hectares? What, how big is a golf course? Is that right? Four hectares. <laughs> Four hectares. Yeah, so two golf courses nearly yep if you're trying to water that you need to know your flow and it needs to be accurate and you want consistency it's to the point now where the majority of the retail clients we deal with want to know that accuracy as well they want to know when their valves are turning on they want to have that convenience of having it at the touch of their hand that they can change their watering times they want to know how much water they've put out because it's getting more expensive and they want their grass to look like a golf course they want their gardens to grow well so we now have all that information available to us we can plan this, how well we want to deliver, we can plan how well we want to irrigate. And so we do that for you, and then obviously you can choose um, what you want to use. Now, you don't need us to do that for you. Obviously, as time goes by, this kind of irrigation session is designed so that you can make those decisions for yourself. It doesn't really change anything from a purchasing standpoint, so you might as well use us if you, if you want to. Um, and even for like what you guys do, if, there's a, if Pete's done a design, that can get punched through to us, and we can design your irrigation for you 
like before it even like gets awarded at the client level and then you know exactly what's happening before you know like we've done it kind of thing and it doesn't cost anything so well it costs me money but it doesn't cost you money so that's the drip the drip, probably enough on the drippers from a sprinkler standpoint obviously a lot of tech this is uh, irrigation's technology doesn't change much like nothing much has been invented except wi-fi controllers which are probably moving slower than they should anyway and then match precipitation nozzles they're the only really new things that have come about um i think in the golf market like rainbird have just released ic which is probably kind of going to be one of the newer cool things for that but red or oh, bluetooth tap timers but nothing ma major changes the spray nozzles that you would have seen in the 90s and the early 2000s before mps really took hold can have a match precipitation design done it's just harder to do it so we can't stick so you've got 10 a's 12 a's you've got the reds the greens the browns like hunter's traditional colors you can't easily put an 8a and a 12a on the same line and get the same delivery of water so we'd need to design the whole system with eights or the whole system with tens or the whole system with twelves or have a weird shaped lawn have one valve on an eight which we know is 30 mil an hour and then the tens might be 20 and i'm getting the numbers wrong but just to give you an idea you you can do it when you use r vans mp rotators rainbird have a match precipitation gear drive nozzle that you can match into the r vans but you can't do it as easily with the sprays. In saying that, for a lot of lawns, people just don't care, and they just pop it up, and it just, there's enough water on there, and it's, they can see the water. A lot of people are more comfortable with that, and it just does it. I probably haven't covered sprays in gardens. Um, MP rotators, can have, like all of the sprinklers I've talked about, can be put on risers and put in gardens, and it will still do the same thing. So you can deliver your 11 mil an hour. You just need to water for longer to get the same amount of water delivery. Um, so that's probably it from a sprinkler standpoint. Uh, so there's van sprays, which I talked about. They're the traditional ones. There's impact sprinklers, which you guys might... I mean, some of you probably haven't even seen an impact sprinkler. Like, how old are you? <laughs> yeah, do you remember... Do you know impact Oh, you'd have them, yeah, because you're on a golf course. But, like, I remember going through kind of Golden Grove, like, early days, and that's all they had. Everyone's front yard just had impact sprinklers, just go, and then all you do is just give it a quick nudge, and the whole head comes off. So, like, I've never kicked one off because I wouldn't like I, I was brought up well, but I've heard of people kicking them. They're quite fragile. So, and they're they're just I don't even we've got some, but they're not as common anymore. So there's the impact sprinklers. Obviously, they use them a lot more in agriculture than they would in ir in irrigation. Now, obviously, slightly different for large uh, turf areas. Gear drives, the original. Like, well, that was probably one of the first technological advancements before the MP, which is just the head turning around, like the PGP, Rainbird 5000, all that jazz. And then obviously now we've moved into the rotators. So that's the, the I guess, the range of sprinklers. Um, if any of that doesn't make sense, I'm happy for you to come and have a look at it. Um, well, there's, a, there's a gear drive. Afterwards, um, while I'm talking about MPs and R vans, I'll just highlight that you can put an MP rotator nozzle on a rainbird body and you can put a rainbird head on a hunter body you can put them on poly risers with adapters you can retrofit these are a um they're a, one of those traditional style sprinklers which is a 10 8 just sprays you can take these heads off now and put an mp rotator head on there instead if you're having troubles with an irrigation system not popping up because there's not enough flow and there's anything other than an MP rotator head on it, you could try an MP rotator head because they use less water per minute than... So these use like maybe four times the amount of water than an MP rotator and say double to triple than a Rainbird R van. So if you've got a system that's not working because the, the water flow has changed in the area because of development or the press, available pressures changed because of, you know, more houses have been built or they've subdivided the property and they're now sharing, you know, this, the water that one house had is now going to two houses. You might look at changing the nozzles out rather than just replacing the whole irrigation system, unless there's obviously R vans in the system. If the water pressure gets so low that sprinklers don't work, then you, need, you can look at drip tube. We've had situations where in um, on Kapringa City Council, the pressure of the council is generally pretty low. Like we're getting 200 kPa static, which is like a dripper needs 140 to kind of open. A sprinkler really needs 275 to be happy and like it has to get up as well so the original pressure the the, the, the starting pressure of a sprinkler is more than the operating pressure because it needs to actually get open and get going so if you can't get a system to work like i don't know how much of that you're getting out your way but if the sprinklers just aren't popping up or you're putting just two sprinklers on a line you can look at putting subsurface drip tube in 
Netafim make a copper sulfate impregnated drip, a dripper. So the rubber diaphragm that's in the dripper, which is the pressure compensating diaphragm, has copper sulfate in it. It's designed to stop root intrusion, so you can put it under lawn and obviously you don't have to use chemicals anymore to stop that. Uh, it's not, the subsurface drip tube is not as popular as it was 06, 07. Um, I think true turf pit, like could you imagine if I told you to water your golf course with drip tube? True turfies won't do it. They, I don't know, there's something about water coming, well it's like it's simulating rain. So it's the water coming from above, you can water fertilizers and obviously plant growth regulators and anything else, you can't necessarily get that through with drip tube. So there's a bit of a definition in here about match precipitation and what precipitation is uh, for anyone that doesn't understand that. Uh, we All we're doing as an irrigation community is trying to simulate rain being delivered. So if we can put out a certain amount of mil per hour using artificial um, an artificial system, which is an irrigation system, we then can work out uh, with the, the proper products how many mil we need to deliver and obviously deliver it. So match precipitation is, like I said before, making sure that every square meter of that lawn is getting exactly the same amount of water. All right. So I talked a little bit before about dual checks um, and having backflow in place. And now I'll go into the manifold side of things. So in Adelaide, we don't generally use master valves as much as we probably should. So that's a manifold with three solenoid valves. So that's the manifold, three solenoid valves. These are a 24 volt AC solenoid valve. So they're an alternating current valve. They run from a battery operator controller on the wall and they have to have cable come out to them. Uh, there is a DC valve or a coil that you can get. The valve, you would identify that by looking at the actual cables and they'd be red and black because the current's relevant. So you have to actually have them wired around the right way. These can wire either way because they're alternating current. And then you'll see here we've got directors just coming out of these valves in some cases and then we've got a pressure reducer coming out of the last valve. The master valve, if there was one installed, would be in front of that. So you'd have, your, you're up, you'd have your water source, you'd have an isolation valve. This is really important so that if you had a blowout or something went wrong, you could isolate the irrigation system or your client could isolate the irrigation system. Can you get me a DVF? Oh, actually, no, it's right. Pretend this is the master valve. So uh, obviously if they, if they had a problem, they want to be able to turn the irrigation system off and they don't, you don't want to go out and fix this system at 12 o'clock or so one o'clock in the morning. Um, they can isolate their system, the backyard stops flooding and you can go address it later, that's there. This master valve would sit here and then that would turn on before any of these turn on. So it's more likely that this would exist on a golf course situation because you've got such large pipes that if something goes wrong on a golf course, it's like we've got some serious problems. So the master valve is that first point of protection before the solenoid valves. Generally, the master valve is going to be the same valve as the solenoid valve, so it's not like you're putting a 1600 kPa valve at the start and then some 1000 kPa's later. It can be a, it can be a case, um, but it's more just having a second point. These kind of valves are gonna last 15 or 20 years. They don't have anything in them that really goes wrong. The, the good quality brands, you just stick them in and they just, they just keep working. There's not much that moves in them um, and they're always lubricated, so there's no wear really. So they just kind of, you just leave them. Um, so people have probably got lazy in Adelaide. and I, I, my, I'm probably part to blame that I wasn't pushing master valves and now I've grown to having a lot of irrigation shops and a lot of staff that are doing what I was doing and I wasn't selling master valves. I don't like the idea of people coming into our shop and us just selling them shit and just being like, oh, you should buy this, you should buy this, you should buy this. Like, obviously we need to sell stuff, but I believe that by doing it, the things right, then people are gonna buy more anyway. So we weren't pushing the master valve. Um, I don't think that the risk versus rewards there, I think, you know, for the extra $25 for the valve plus whatever other infrastructure needs to go in place, because that's now two valve boxes, if not three. I just think they've got five year warranty valve, the last 20 years, they generally don't have a problem, I don't think, it needs to be there, but I just want you to know that it is an option. And if you went to WA, you'd probably find that there's master valves in every system just because the cultural practices of irrigation are different. And I'd say in the, in the US, and if anyone's watching on YouTube, let me know, I'd say they're putting master valves in more often. And it might be different from Texas to Florida as well. I just, every, every market has these different cultural 
practices and we're not a master valvey town. I also sadly don't think we're a backflow town, but um, you should be putting them in. So when a controller actuates those, uh, that system, it will turn the master valve on and valve one or valve two or valve three and so on. So the valve will open, the pressure will come through, pop the valve, then that will flood the manifold with more pressure or the same water flow and pressure and pop whatever valve it needs to. The master valve will stay on through the cycle and then it'll turn on and off and on and off and on and off and on and off. The pressure reducer that's on this valve, this, this is a kind of very traditional setup for a residential irrigation system with two sprinkler solenoids and a garden. We're putting a 25 psi pressure reducer on that sprinkler to get the pressure down to 25 psi. So if you've got drip tube, I don't have any drip tube. We talked about it before. Reedy, can you cut me some, a piece of drip tube off? Like just enough so I can get a, cut a dripper open. Um, with drip tube, you follow me with the camera? <laughs> so with drip tube, uh, we want the pressure that's coming into the drip tube to be accurate. If you've got 600 kPa coming in, you, you're just not going to get that. Um, the pressure compensating factor doesn't work. So you, all of a sudden you're going to have um, too much water trying to squeeze out and it just won't work properly. Just cut off an end if you can. Just, we won't sell that roll. We will. <laughs> They come with an extra meter anyway. Um, yeah, so uh, if you've got too much pressure coming through, the drip tube won't work properly. The same happens with sprinklers. If you've got like an MP rotator, if you've got too much pressure being delivered to an MP rotator, you can't adjust it down. So we have people ring us and say, oh, I can't get my MP rotator to adjust, ang uh, like to adjust its distance. The angle will kind of still work. It's just when you're trying to get that distance to come back, it doesn't work because the pressure is too high and it just won't adjust. So. In, there's an argument that you could have a pressure reducer on these as well. If they were putting water straight out of a standard pop-up sprinkler, it wouldn't matter. It would just mist a bit. These still have a happy place as well. So if they're 300 kPa, 25 psi. I'm talking kPa and psi. Sprinkler data is always in kPa, as is drip tube. Well, we talk about it that way and then pressure reducers are all sold in PSI. So the multiplier is seven point, sorry, 6.9 or seven. So 25 times seven, I think it's 161 or something. That's delivering 160 kPa at the pressure reducer. You still get pressure loss through the pipe that gets out to the dripper. And as long as this is getting water delivered to it at between 150 and 220, the drippers are gonna open properly and they're gonna be happy and everything's gonna work. So that's that. I'm just gonna open up one of these. Can you give me a dripper yet? just to show you what's inside. So this is a piece of Netafirm drip tube. It's a 13 mil drip tube, so it's an Australian size. Rainbird were bringing in some drip tube that was 16 mil. It was a real pain in the ass. Like you, you guys all carry 13 mil fittings and then you go to a job and there's 16 mil drip tube. It's just because it's US, a US size. The, um, actually I'll just show you. These, these are how the cutters work by twisting when you cut. And so you get a nice clean cut. Um, they didn't rejig their machines, so they were making the tube in the US and then shipping it over here. All of the tube we sell, so the Netafem tube is made in Melbourne and the Toro tube is made in Beverly here in South Australia. So if you have a, uh, I guess a desire to buy as local as possible, uh, the irrigation industry is probably one of the most locally supportive industries because it has to be, because everything we sell has so much air in it that it, you're crazy to make it offshore and then bring it in. People, I've seen people try and bring in PVC and Blue Line from India before um, and China and it just doesn't, I mean, I don't think the cost savings are out, are like you're not getting the same quality and you're obviously not supporting local industry, but valve boxes, PVC, anything that doesn't have, a, uh, I guess, a digital component in it generally is made here. All the, the PVC fittings, the stormwater fittings, valve boxes, drip tube, poly risers, poly pipe, Screwed fittings, blue line fittings are all made in South Australia. Actually, our screwed fittings are made in New Zealand, I think. So this is a dripper that's been made, uh, a Netafem dripper. So there's just a, a boat dripper mounted on the inside wall of the tube. Toro's tube is a, a cylinder dripper. You see that? So inside that dripper has a rubber diaphragm. The rubber diaphragm uh, sits over a labyrinth. It's like a path of um, where the water goes through. I can't explain how it works, but the rubber diaphragm ensures that the amount of water being delivered is correct, provided that it's got the right amount of pressure coming in. So that's a manifold. You can make manifolds out of 
a few different things. I've seen recently people making manifolds out of copper with copper press fittings. Have you seen the copper that you crush, like the fitting, and you just get one of those, it's like a jaw with a battery attached to it and just crushes around the copper. They look really neat. Obviously, uh, if you've got a $4,000 copper press tool, then by all means, you can make your copper. If you're a plumber, it makes it easy. These manifold fittings uh, are a swivel fitting, so we use these a lot because the client can take that fitting out and then deal with the problem they might be having and put it back in without having to take the manifold out of the ground. You can also extend these manifolds by taking the cap off the end and putting more manifold parts on there. On a golf course, you're using PVC traditionally, obviously, and gluing that. I think you can, you start, we're starting to see electrofusion being brought in a lot more. A manifold on a golf course is just bigger. So each valve's in its own box and it's separated by a meter or two of pipe or more. Uh, if you wanted to, you can make your manifolds out of PVC and glue it together. You can make it using these fittings or you can make it out of copper, like I said. Uh, the advantages of making a manifold out of PVC is it's gonna cost you a lot less money and you're generally not gonna have any of those like slight leaks that happen at the start. These manifolds here, no glue required dry instantly you can leave site straight away as soon as you've got it and it's in sometimes you'll see slight leaks occurring or squirting out if they're not sealed properly they've got an o-ring seal on them so the idea is not to use thread tape on these manifolds because the o-rings are actually what seals some people choose to like i said every um, irrigation area has its own kind of cultural practices thread tape you would have all seen i'm hoping by now um, they put a little bit of thread tape on on one bit Anything that's got an O-ring seal on it doesn't need thread tape. That doesn't have an O-ring seal, so we would thread tape the outlet. That doesn't, that doesn't, that doesn't. The only time that you won't be using thread tape for a non-O-ring seal is when you screw a sprinkler onto a fitting. Never, ever, ever thread tape these. Um, you'll find on a lot of the sprinklers it says on the bottom, no pipe dope, which is a US term. That, I believe, is pipe dope or the liquid version of it. You should be able to just screw these in and they seal and that's it. You'll get a sense for how tight that is um, and if it's not quite right it doesn't matter and if it leaks slightly it's going to leak into the irrigation system that you're trying to water so it's okay but it shouldn't leak. So there's that. Um, is anyone using articulated risers with their systems? I know you guys would probably on all your systems. Have you, do you guys know what that is? Articulated riser? No. Can you get ready to grab me an Arctic, a 15 mil Arctic, please? So another cultural thing that we don't do here is we don't use articulated risers. So that's a sprinkler on a fitting. A fitting gets pipe pushed onto it, clamp it up with either metal or plastic clamps, and it's done. You sit it at the right height and then you're happy. If the soil, uh, you top dress the lawn and it gets higher or it thatches up and you need to raise your sprinkler, you need to dig it up undo that, put a little riser on there, screw it back up. An articulated riser eliminates the need for you to do that. It's just residentially, they don't, we don't seem to use them here. I, I, again, further, like with that, I feel kind of partially responsible for it because it's not something that we've ever pushed. I feel like it's, it just adds more money and more work to the job. And when you see an articulated riser, you'll hopefully see what I mean. An articulated riser enables you to dig up the whole area, not disconnect anything, and just lower or raise the sprinkler and then backfill around it. They'd use it all the time on a golf course. If something changes, you know, even if they have a new design of the of a green or, or if something or if a tee block gets raised or changed or they top dress or they have to put new turf down, they can just dig it up, raise it up, or if a golf cart's driven over it and crushed it, it doesn't damage everything underneath it. The riser generally takes the brunt of it because it's it's just a piece of pipe that flexes. You, you'll know what I mean when, you sh when I show you. Did you, did you get him? Yeah. He's probably trying to find one. Um, so yeah, articulated risers is something worth knowing about. Uh, whether or not you should be putting them in residential irrigation systems. I don't think the, it's, it all comes down to that risk versus reward like I was talking about with the master valve. Like the chances of you having to dig up and raise a sprinkler within five years is so unlikely that it might not be worth needing to dig down. Thanks man and put these arctic risers in so the smallest one we stock is a 15 by a half inch so the sprinkler would sit on the elbow in wa again these this is all they use like if we sell systems over there because obviously like i said we sell all over the country um if someone posts a comment about it on the wa lawn addicts people will be like where's the arctics because it just doesn't make sense to them so then you'd have your fitting 
you screw your articulated riser into your fitting. Again, no thread tape, I'm gonna knock myself out. Uh, so then your poly pipe goes past there, but look at the height difference. So you're digging down 300 plus a little bit, but then that sprinkler, you could sit it like that, or you could sit it like that. So you could actually have your pipe kind of go, but that's almost hitting the sprinkler, so you could go the other way. So like that. So you could have your pipe running through there and then you just raise and lower your sprinkler to suit. Obviously the sprinkler's moving side to side when you do that, it's not moving enough for it to be a massive issue, especially with things like MP rotators. You don't, like you can be sh short on your head to head by, I think it's up to four or 600 and you still get match precipitation and we're talking 80 or 100 mil. So usually a council or a golf course would set them at 45 or thereabouts and that gives them freedom to move up and down. So you can buy them if you need, if you want to for your irrigation systems. Um, if you're getting a quote from us for it, you'd need to ask for it because we won't put it in residentially. All commercial systems, they'll be specified. Uh, golf course systems, they have like proper O-ring ones. I don't even know if we've got them here, but they can handle pressure because on a golf course, a lot of the sprinklers have the valve in their sprinkler. So we're looking at solenoid valve here, sending water out to a system. That's called a block system. So the sprinkler is a, is a block of sprinklers running from a valve. For these guys, they'll have a sprinkler with a valve in it, valve and head, with a coil and the cables, and the controller will send electricity out and pop that one sprinkler up because there's putting out 80, 120 litres, oh, probably not that much, 50 litres a minute out of a sprinkler, and so they can then choose to work out, like the system can learn what sprinklers are using and go, okay, let's put on like four sprinklers around a T block on the 18th and then we'll turn on, you know, the green on the 12th because they can w operate at the same time and the, the, like the water's getting shared and we can get our watering windows down. A little bit more of an advanced thing, but worth understanding. So residentially we're running block systems and they're from an automatic solenoid valve like that. Um, running water out through 19 or 13 or 25 mil poly. Obviously you can clamp that poly up with whatever you choose, but you do need to put clamps on your poly. And Telco say their takeoff adapters don't need clips. They've done tests that the plastic that they use is so like sharp from the molding process that you, you just physically couldn't pull it out. I wouldn't encourage you to do that, but um, if you're gonna at minimum put a plastic clip on and at best put a stainless steel clamp on, your stainless steel clamps are going to cost you four times as much, but you are never, ever, ever going back to a stainless steel clamp. The clips we sell are made here in South Australia by Antelco, so they're, uh, um, like I said, locally made product. You'll find that these are quite hard to break. If you went into a Bunnings and grabbed one of their clips and bent it back on itself, like you're not going to get that. It'll just snap because they're made in Taiwan or China or wherever they, I think they're made in Taiwan. Uh, the plastic they use for this, I don't know what it is, I will be able to find out if you need to. It's just a stronger plastic. It doesn't get as brittle and they last a lot longer. Even though they've got UV stabilizers in them and then they are black, over time they'll get brittle in the sun. They take a lot longer to get brittle. Obviously, if you've got metal clamps, they're just forever. So, uh, there is, it's important to know that you have flow loss through your 13 and your 19 and your 25 mil pipe. If you've got an irrigation sprinkler system, I think, I think if we're going above 30 litres a minute, the guys are designing through one inch poly. So when you do your flow test, I mean, we'd size that for you, but if you're making those decisions yourself, and this is probably a weird one for you because everything's like, you know, 40 or 50 or 80 mil. But if you're doing uh, sprinklers and there's above 30 litres a minute, you want to go to inch poly. I don't have any here. If you go to 19 or 13 mil pipe, especially 13 mil, I'd definitely stay away from that for sprinklers. The velocity through the pipe can get too high and you'll find it squealing and either, you, we design our irrigation systems velocity to be under two litres per second per second, I think that's right. I miss Matt, don't tell him I said that. Um, and then the, yeah, so if you get, the velocity's too high, the system just won't work properly. It squeals and it shudders and you'll get water hammer when it turns off. So you wanna make sure that you're sizing your pipes to the right size for your system. You can put uh, a sprinkler like this on 19 or 25 mil, we stock the fittings for both. It doesn't have to be just like half inch thread goes on 19 mil fitting or obviously the bigger sprinkler needs to go on. So you, you could theoretically run these on 19 mil or 25 mil depending on the flow. All right, uh, so that is up to manifolds. Now controlling these systems 
There's a bit of information, a bit of detail there. Does anyone need to have a break? Do you want to stop for five and toilets, waters? Bring your girlfriend and your wife? No, nah. all good, we'll keep going. So, um, I talked before about the cables on the solenoid valves being black and black. So the polarity of the way these are wired up doesn't matter when you're running from a traditional irrigation controller. This is a traditional irrigation controller. It's a Rainbird uh, ESP TM2. It's Wi-Fi compatible, so you can get a dongle for it and you can start to communicate with this from your mobile phone or your iPad or your tablet or whatever you choose to use. This would then have the programming set inside the controller and then when it's time to turn on, it sends an electrical pulse through the active and the common, right? So there's a common cable running from every controller. The common wire goes to every valve on the manifold, including the master valve, and then the actives go out from there. So I'll just draw this up on the board so that it gives you a better idea. I need more colors. Where do I put that texture? So an irrigation controller has all the brain stuff in here and then obviously it has an area down the bottom to wire things into. So you've got um, your common, then it will have a master valve, then one, two, three, four and so on. So those then manifold sit like that. That's horrible. That's really bad. Just pretend that's a really well drawn manifold and then there'll be a master valve here. Um, so you've got one, two, three, and four. So every, so off of the top of these valves, there is two cables off every valve. As I said, polarity does not matter. So the common goes to one of every valve. So it doesn't matter which one. And in Australia, black is used as a common as an industry standard. I found out recently in America, white is used as an industry standard for the common. All cable comes with black and white in the first three cables I'm pretty sure. The cable I have here is 13 core. Uh, sorry, the cable I have here is seven core. So there's seven different colored tables inside this roll. Uh, there is black, white, green, brown, blue, red, and yellow. So I think the way it works is they put black and white plus one color in three core, then black and white and the same color plus two colors in five core, and then it goes out through seven and nine and 13. The cable comes in single core, three core, five core, seven core, nine core, and 13 core. I think the reason why they're, they're odd, I don't really know if this is right, but because you're putting a common out plus the actives, there's always an even number of actives. So if you have a system with five, uh, four solenoid valves and a master valve, you obviously have five valves there, plus the common is six. You wanna put seven core in, you've got a spare wire if you ever need it. A lot of the times we'll have clients putting in an extra two or three cables as a spare. There are devices available that you can purchase that you can fit to your system if you don't have enough cable um, called uh, splitters. There's two different ways that, that you can do it. There's one that can split, I think it splits the total time and it just alternates between them and there's another one that learns how long they go for and then you can, it can split one station up to four, four stations so then you put the device in the valve box it'll have two cables going to the device and then that device then splits out to the valves in the box. Ideally for the cost of cable, if you're concerned, just put a bit more in. Most of the time, these systems do not um, change. You know, most people are building a house on a 500 square meter block and the water flow is not gonna change and the amount of lawn's not gonna change. So the reality is it shouldn't change. If you can put in one or two extra cables, then go for it. <coughs> Black cable to every single one. I used to wire, my actives alphabetically, so blue, brown, I don't remember what it was, green. So I, I had a system, so I knew that valve one was the first letter of the alphabet, valve two, valve three, and so on. So you go through your colors. Obviously, if you're wiring past 13 valves, you're starting your colors again, and then it might be worth adding labels to them. So we've wired up, I'm gonna stop putting stuff down. So we've wired up the common to every common, and then all you're doing is then going, all right, so the master valve is gonna get wired up like that, and then valve number one is gonna get wired up like that, and then valve number two is going to there and so on. So when, a, when the controller knows that it's time to send electricity out, 
This controller is a 240 volt controller plugged into a normal 10 amp power point residentially and it transforms that power down to 24 volt alternating current. So the alternating current means it's going up and down the cables which is why we don't care which way it is because the current's moving up and down all the time. Sends out a signal through those two cables to actuate this valve. So that's turning on because it's getting a circuit. The way the solenoid valves work is they have this is the solenoid coil. It's an electromagnetic pin. When it sends power down there, it lifts the pin. It changes the pressure in the valve. The valve pops open, water goes through. If power is cut to that cable for any reason, that valve will shut off. Like it needs the power going to it constantly. That's why you can hear it buzzing. If you can hear solenoid valves going, you'll hear this If you're trying to find a valve that's buried, they use that to find it. So they can use a clicker to get it to bounce up and down or to buzz. That opens that. Then it sends, at the same time, it's sending power through common and one. So obviously you've got that, oh, I didn't join that one. Oh, I did, yeah, there it is. So then it's making a circuit for valve number one. So the master valve's open and valve number one's open. Most controllers can't open more than two valves at a time because of the amperage that it needs. There's only a certain amount of power coming out of the controller. It can open a master valve and one. If you tried to wire in two and three all into the one port and try and create this artificial load sharing where you're getting all the valves to pop up at once, you might struggle to get the valves to open because there's not enough power to lift the pin. Think garden lights when you start putting them on. Like there's only so much you can do before you run out of power. So has anyone got any questions about anything so far? No? All good? Cool. As I said at the start, you want to try and well, no, you don't want to try. You definitely want to protect any of your cables from getting wet. So, and this is probably good, a good thing to touch on in general. Irrigation systems don't like dirt and the electrical side doesn't like water. So when you're putting in your irrigation systems, you need to make sure to the best of your ability, you stop any dirt from getting into these. MP rotators are super sensitive about dirt. And if you get dirt into the sprinkler head, you're generally gonna to have to throw it out. They're not something that you can flush. If you get dirt into your drip tube and your drippers, you're gonna have a similar problem. You can flush it out better, and some of the drippers have self-cleaning functions, but avoid dirt in the system, avoid water in the electrical. You could solder these joins. Most people don't. Most people are using a gel connector like these and the smaller version of these. So these gel connectors have metal teeth inside them, which you, which sit in a, a silicon or a gel, it's like, a, um, like silicon. So they, it sits there, it's different to the silicon you'll get in a tube because it sits in these gel connectors and doesn't go hard. You push your wire joints into that and then crush that and those metal teeth are meant to slide past the cable and pierce the sheath and then they, they make a connection. The problem is the cable sizes on here, the plastic around that, is a lot thicker than the cable that comes in here. So what you find is when you're using a wire joint like this to join that to that, is that the big cable kind of pushes the little cable out the way and it doesn't pierce the sheath. So whenever I'm doing these, and I don't do it much anymore, I'm getting the, the cable and actually taking the, use a proper wire joiner for this, a uh, wire um, sheather, what am I trying to say, wire stripper and cut back, say a centimetre or two, I twist them together and then slide them into these housings and then crush them. So just make sure that there's no metal exposed and you've got that uh, gel covering that. At controller level, you're same deal, you're sheathing them back, you're pushing them up here and you're just screwing them into the controller. Some controllers have like a thing you can push up and stick them in or others you just screw it in. Um, we, I would recommend buying outdoor controllers wherever possible. A lot of companies still sell indoor controllers. I don't get it. Um, they're just, they're not that much more expensive to buy an outdoor controller. Um, the transformer's inside. So everything's fully encapsulated. So you can put your conduit in there. All the wire joints are in here. Um, even though a controller's safely like in your house, bugs can get across the ports and um, short them out. Spiders are gonna get into an indoor controller. So if you can avoid, um, if you can buy outdoor controllers, do it. They look nicer as well. So that's the transformer on an outdoor controller. Indoor controllers have a transformer external to that, similar to, can't even think of what else has got an outdoor transformer, but, you know when you open up the box and it's got the black transformer and then it's got the wire then you have to wire it in it just i don't think it looks as good um and i think similar to pressure compensating drip tube and non-pressure compensating drip tube i just feel like the market's moved past that now and we just stock outdoor controllers this is an outdoor eight station as i said before it's wi-fi compatible 
I'll talk about Wi-Fi and Bluetooth in a sec. So these are all the ports where the wires come from. It's got similar to, oh, you probably can't see it from there, but there's CM and then one through to eight. So you wire up all your cables through that, put them in a conduit if you can. Uh, it's not really an industry standard to put cable in conduit in the ground. It might be for you guys more than anyone else, because, no, so you just run it, just tape it to the main line or just have it in the same trench or whatever. I just, same deal, I think a lot of this comes down to risk versus reward. You know, you put, what do we, we sold some conduit to a commercial project the other day, 40 mil conduit was like 12 bucks for four meters. You think about that over a two kilometer run of cable versus burying it that deep next to a main line, you never, it's never gonna get hit. And even if it does, it's a repair. So um, it's up to you whether or not you use conduit for your cable. I do recommend running a conduit from ground level up the wall into the controller. The sheath that's wrapped around the cable is not UV stable. So that red sheath or whatever color it is, in time will just deteriorate and come off and then you've got exposed cables. The red's not relevant to anything. Red's just a color that Australia or South Australia, like uh, Rainbird tried to make the cable green. Toro's red. Toro was selling cable before Rainbird here in SA. Um, you go to other states, you'll find a lot of their cables are blue or green. It doesn't matter. Um, that's just the external sheath that protects the cable. This is what I was talking about before. So this is a pressure versus flow gauge. Like, it looks the same, right? Pretty much? Yep, cool, someone gets a prize. Um, so you, this is flexible, this is mains pressure rated, that goes onto your water source. So if it's on a course, you might get into the valve box and put it straight onto a valve. If it's at a house, you just put it on a tap. We're adjusting that ball valve to get this gauge to move and then we're watching the digital meter and then sticking that in a bucket or shooting one of the other people on site and just getting the water away from it. Um, commercially, we put a longer hose on that and we generally fill up a, buck, uh, uh, a wheelie bin. So these digital meters, once they get above 120, 130 liters a minute, start to freak out a bit. So we'll time a 100 liter wheelie bin on site. Um, we have that as a service for commercial clients where we'll go do a pressure versus flow test for them. Our irrigation design department heavily, heavily relies on pressure versus flow at design stage and then our supply side. We, if we have a job that we design and the client doesn't test the pressure versus flow, but we've been given a pressure versus flow before we start and the system doesn't work, it's like, a world of trouble. It's much easier to go test the pressure versus flow at the time of commencement of the job. And you guys are doing commercial work now, obviously, not every day. If you've got a design that's been done and you go out there and start the work and you finish the whole job and there's like exposed ag has been done and everything's finished and then nothing pops up, that's a lot harder to deal with than come back to us and go, hey, we just did a pressure versus flow. It's heaps different. What's the go? And we can then go back to the, your client and go, hang on, something's changed. We tested this two months ago. What's changed? They're like, oh yeah, SA Water just dropped the pressure because there was too many pipes blowing out and it was costing too much money. So then we can make a change. So I, I, I go on about it, but it's super important, especially commercially. I could also argue residentially, but test, if you do a flow versus pressure test when you quote the job, it's not a bad idea to retest it. This would probably be as much for you guys as well, actually, days. When you go back to the site to test it and go, hang on, it's changed, what's changed? And they're like, oh, yeah, we've cut the water or we've changed something, or because then you can deal with it at that level rather than getting all the way into a job and it not working. So controllers on the wall, it's turned on. It's sending the electricity out to the valves. The valves are popping up, water's flowing out. Sprinklers are popping up, delivering match precipitation. Everyone's happy. If the cable gets cut, the sprinkler, the valves will close. The only time that that is different is if we use a battery operated system. So I talked before about red and black cables. Obviously with the world getting busier and people just sticking shit everywhere and then like, like houses being built on top of each other, stuff goes wrong. And a lot of times we can't get cable from a control point to a valve point, so we have to look at an alternative solution. At the moment, there's no Wi-Fi-ish solution. Lisa's got beers. Anyone want a beer? Are you allowed to have beer? Anyone here allowed to have beer? <laughs> you can nod and smile, and I'll just push the camera up. Oh, there's beers there if anyone wants a beer. Don't be shy. Um, one of you has to have one, because then everyone won't feel bad. Be that person. Be a leader <laughs> in your community. Drink beer. Um, yeah, so the... Um, the battery operated style, style system has a red and a black cable on the thing. I'll let you guys get your beers and I'll have some of my, my new beer. Super exciting. If anyone wants a really good beer, I've got craft beer here as well. We just generally don't put it in that esky. 
They're all good. Twist. I was like, you can't open it. <laughs> all good. Um, so a battery operated solenoid valve, the bottom of the valve is exactly the same. So when we sell you a battery operated solenoid valve, the only thing that's different is the coil, so the way it actuates. So that's a coil, right? On a battery operated system, as I've said repeatedly, red and black. So a battery operated controller has cables coming off of it. It has a black and a bunch of reds. So in this situation, if you had, a, say, Hunter node will be the one you know of because Hunter node is basically the esky of battery operated valves. It was the first to market. Everyone calls a node a node. Even if you buy a Rainbird WPX, you'll ask for a node. That's just what people call them. Can you see that? Yeah. Yep. So a Hunter node, if it's just on a valve, it's just node to valve. Now those cables are different colors. One's black and one's red. And then it sends a direct current, so it's a DC valve, to the coil and turns the valve on. If you're buying a node or a WPX with more than one, it will have a black cable coming off of it, a bunch of red cables, and in some cases, this is yellow today, a yellow cable like that. The yellow cable can be used to hook up a sensor, so if you cut that, that won't work. Then you've got to wire a sensor into it. So the way this works is you've got your valves and they all have their black cable going to them and then each one of them has the red cable going to them. But then that's one, two, three, four. We talked about alternating current through those solenoid valves and the need for the valve to have continuous electrical current running to the coil for it to stay open because it's going like that and holding the pin up. The way a battery operated coil works is it sends a nine volt pulse through to the coil and it locks the coil open with a magnet and it holds it open and it doesn't send it any more power. So that's why you can stick two nine volt batteries in one of these controllers and not look at them for two years because it's not sending continuous power to the valve. It's sending power to the coil, locking it, and then sending another pulse of nine volts to it to unlock it and drop it when it wants to turn it off. Now, I said before, if the power gets cut from there, they turn off. If the battery runs flat, mid cycle, which is like cross lotto kind of odds, it won't send a pulse back to turn it off and it stays on. So uh, you can actuate a nine volt coil with a nine volt battery. So you can get a nine volt battery and just tap it on the, on the pins and it will pop the, uh, the pin up and down to turn it on and off. These have a place in the market. I don't think it's, it's not best practice to be putting these in every job. Um, it's a lot easier for clients that if they don't want to dig uh, cable out, they're not Wi-Fi compatible yet, and they're not um, electricity like forever. So you need to make sure that if you're putting battery operated systems in, that you're gonna go replace the batteries obviously, otherwise they don't work. And the only time you're gonna find that out is when there's dead lawn or dead garden. So there are Bluetooth versions of this product available now. So you can program the actual device from a phone with Bluetooth and it will tell you how much battery life's left. So Playford City Council have got a lot of these nodes in there um, roadways, they can drive past now, check the battery, turn them off um, through winter and then go back and turn them off without getting out of the car so they've got safety, like they're not, they're not walking around in the middle of roundabouts and that. Most of the time if there's a node on a council site it's because it's in a roundabout or in an area that it's, you can't run cable to so it's also an area that's probably not as safe to be walking out to. With a council situation if you've got a controller, you can centralise the controller and run it back to base using a 4G SIM or now what's about to be 5G SIMs and communicate with those controllers from anywhere in the world. So if the so Adelaide City Council is a client of ours, when the V8s were on, they need to shut that whole site down. Sprinklers popping up during a V8 supercar race, not a good idea. They can turn the whole council off from one button on a computer. This, you can't do that. So you'd have to go out and find each node, remember where they are. Councils are notoriously bad at knowing where all their stuff is. They're getting better now. They've got lots more um, kind of geotagging of park benches and bins and controllers and that kind of thing. But traditionally, there could be stuff like this that's lost for five or seven years in a park that's not being watered anymore because someone put it there, it's just never been back. So that's how they work. Same wiring process, make sure you're using, where's my paper? Oh, there. Make sure you're using um, waterproof connectors or solder. Like I said, solder is really not the 
the be all and end all. Uh, rain sensors, and I'm probably going to cop shit from this at some point from someone that manufactures them, but I just think they're shit. I don't think rain sensors are good enough to hinge your whole house on one tiny plastic hole that big with some leather discs that expand if rain happens to go in the hole that's I shit you not like two or three mil obviously weather stations for a golf course I get it but they're thirty thousand dollars or if you're referencing Adelaide um, or rain buckets like tipping buckets that actually catch water but most of the rain sensors that you can attach to an irrigation controller that you get for free when you buy a controller or that you buy for sixty nine dollars on Amazon or whatever I just think it's dangerous to, you've got all these microclimates in your, in, just in a backyard and you're shutting your whole system down just based on the data from one rain sensor that happens to be on a corner that might be blocked by something and the rain and it evaporates differently and all that. So with the technology that's available today, you're better off in my opinion, and just my opinion, using a Wi-Fi controller and having the weather data that's occurring that's actually tracked by proper weather stations, reference back to your controller and adjust your controller run times based on real time weather data that's occurred rather than a rain sensor that's mounted to your gutter. So it's just important to know if you do choose to put a rain sensor in, you can get wireless rain sensors and wired rain sensors. They just wire into a sensor port. That's the sensor port. So at the moment the rain sensor is that yellow cable, which means it's closed because it's a closed circuit. If you cut that, it, the controller will think that there's a break in the rain sensor which has occurred from water breaking the circuit by expanding some discs made of leather that evaporate at the same rate as soil in everyone's house. Like, Anyway, uh, as I said before, run conduit from there if you can. Usually you get one stick for four, or four meters, cut it in half, you've got two jobs. Uh, Bluetooth and Wi-Fi is important to talk about. Bluetooth is not Wi-Fi and Wi-Fi is not Bluetooth. I know that all of you know that and that you're super intelligent. There might be people watching this that do not understand that you cannot run a Bluetooth tap timer through your Wi-Fi controller. Um, actually you can, but it's Bluetooth to Bluetooth. So traditionally you've got a Bluetooth tap timer, right? You want that to program, you get your phone, you can program it, all good. Then you go to Europe because you're super uh, flexible with COVID and you just got your private jet and you shoot over to Europe and you want to talk to this controller. People thought that they could talk to it through their Wi-Fi. Now, with this brand you can, but traditionally you couldn't. So the way Orbit have done it is they have the controller and I see this coming into the rest of the market soon. It, no one's talked about it yet, but there's an irrigation controller on the wall and that's communicating with a tap timer via Bluetooth, right? So the controller has Bluetooth and Wi-Fi, and then the controller's communicating back out into the internet through a router, back out to you in Europe on your boat. So you can send your signal back to your controller, and then your controller can communicate with tap timers now through the Bluetooth. So you can have a Bluetooth tap timer on a veggie patch that's really old, um, and there's too much concrete there to get valves and cable out to, so that's there. And then the traditional controller, that is that, can still have cables running out to a traditional wired solenoid valve bank. And then you can communicate via Wi-Fi to your controller and say, hey controller, I want to change the times for these, but I also want you to communicate with this tap timer via Bluetooth that I need this to change as well. That's technology that's only really just come about thanks to Orbit. I see there being, if it doesn't exist already, and I don't believe it does, a point where these valves here are all Bluetooth valves with batteries in them. So they're effectively orbit nodes, which they won't be called. This controller is a Wi-Fi controller that communicates to them via Bluetooth. And then you just have to go change the batteries on these, and then that can communicate back to your phone via the internet. I think that's coming. The technology's there for these guys. I think the hard thing is with irrigation is that the cost of delivering the technology that's available is not getting the same return that it needs to. The irrigation industry is such a tiny industry. Like you think about, like from a, a social media standpoint, it sucks. Like no one gives a shit about this. It's not sexy. Like what am I supposed to post? So you imagine, like you think about building a new iPhone 12, they're like wicked, like, you know, 40 million in the first year or whatever you bring out the new Wi-Fi Bluetooth controller, like no one cares. 
So the technology is there, but I just I think it needs to get cheap enough to make it worthwhile. I think they're going to put the technology from this in these soon, and you're going to start to see a, a slight shift in how it works. If battery technology gets to the point where they can put a solar panel on top of those valves that's that big that keeps them charged without any issues, like bird shit and dust and that covering the solar panel, or like self-cleaning solar panels, I think you'll see a lot of change and then you won't need to go replace the batteries and then that will become the norm. And then obviously cable doesn't need to be run anymore, costs go down, copper's expensive, all that. So that's tap timers. Obviously you can go to the real basic mechanical tap timer. Um, obviously you need to go turn that off if it's, it needs to be turned off. With tap timers, be really careful. Uh, if you're buying tap timers, even from us, but especially from hardware shops, to check the pressure rating on your tap timer. This tap timer is rated from 69 to 700 kPa. Remember I talked before about pressure spiking to 1000, 1050 kPa. Sometimes your house will have too much pressure to run this tap timer. If you have a concern about it, you can buy static pressure reducers. This is not static. This is only being able to be used when water's flowing freely through it. You can buy static ones that will screw to a tap, which means they can be under mains pressure and mount that above that. And that protects that, but not this. There's another version of this. You can buy mains pressure tap timers. I think Rainbirds is, but that's the only Bluetooth compatible controller one. So just be aware of that. Uh, what else have we got there? Obviously, yeah, Bluetooth and um, Bluetooth and Wi-Fi are not the same. Now we've got a bit of time. I want to talk a bit about troubleshooting. No, I mean, so just to kind of re-go over all that. That's irrigation. Like that's the basics of irrigation. You get water and you deliver it through a system and it comes out the other end efficiently and everything in between is what we've just talked about. Um, obviously, there's probably stuff that I haven't covered there. There's probably questions that you might have. If you've got questions, feel free to ask them now. Otherwise, when this finishes, if you want to come up to me and ask me, whatever you're thinking, other people are probably thinking, and I know you probably, it's the kind of teacher saying, but um, if there's no questions, I'll go into troubleshooting and then that's pretty much it. Um, so, no questions? Cool. Remember, you have a test when you get back to work. All right, they've got this. They've got this document. So, uh, usually, w obviously, we get phone calls from time to time from people that are struggling with any irrigation problems. The majority of the problems that are occurring are around solenoid valves. We generally don't have too much I mean, sometimes a sprinkler is not popping up, but if it's been designed properly and the water flow that we've been given is correct and they've put it in properly, it works. Solenoid valves are, are, are probably the only thing that, goes, that, that can really go wrong. Um, so I'm just going to put up a few different things and see if you can help me with that. So, my valve won't open. So we've just talked about that. Does anyone have an idea on why a 24 volt AC solenoid valve won't open? I'm not telling you either, you have to tell me. Power. Power, yep. So if there's no electricity going through the valve, it will not open. So, hi, my valve won't open. All right, cool. Have you checked that there's power running to the valve? Oh, I don't know how to do that. All right, so there's a few ways we can do that. You can do a, an ohms resistance test at the controller and see if the controller's working. You can go out there and actually unscrew the coil and listen to it while it's working. You can check, you can cut that coil off and wire another coil to the same cable and try to get, see if there's another coil working if that one's not. Um, generally, or you can check that the controller's still, that the controller's even turned on. Um, so there's a few things there. Um, you could take, check the wire joins. Like, so there's, there's a, the idea behind the troubleshooting side of this is it's, it's probably the most real life like all the stuff that I've just taught you you could probably have picked up over the years and you're just like yeah well we know that we put a system in I didn't know about the dual check but cool we'll start doing it this is what's the real stuff that's going to happen when you go out to site and it's 3 30 on a Friday afternoon and your boss or you are or the clients just like I need this fix like we're going away on the weekend and you're like holy shit I want to go home it's the end of the week what shall I do so you want to work out the the, the quickest solutions that are easiest first. So obviously from a power standpoint, the first thing is open the controller. Is it on, right? It could be simply that the client's turned it off. 
Every one of your clients will lie to you. It's guaranteed. They didn't touch the controller. They haven't been out there. I didn't. It's not turned off. Like, no, we didn't change our Wi-Fi password. I don't know what's wrong with it. Like, all of that shit happens all the time. So, is the controller turned on? You can check that straight away. It might be simply fixing that. If you've got the app, and you can, as a as a contractor, you can actually have a parent-child relationship with the app. So, you've got your Wi-Fi dongle plugged into the controller. You run all your clients all your clients' devices through your phone, and then they have child access, so they have to put a password in, and if they make an edit, it, you can track it and say, no, you changed it, because you put your pin in, I've seen that you've changed it. So you might be able to deal with that at this level without going out to site. Pro power, another interesting one is the, the valve might not have turned on in their opinion, because it wasn't meant to turn on. So yeah, it was power, but that's because the controller wasn't actually meant to send power out there, because it's Saturday and we note water on Saturdays. If you don't, if it's not that, then you might need to go out there. You need to check the integrity of the wire. So the quickest thing, the quickest way to test the controller is actually working, is you could go perform an ohms resistance test using a multimeter at the coil down the other end. So you test to see if there's power actually going through the controller before you start cutting cable. As soon as you start cutting cables, opening valve boxes, taking solenoid valves out, you're adding half an hour, an hour of your time. A lot of this stuff, all these basic tests, can be done really quickly, and you can be back in your car and going home. All right, so power, what else? What My valve won't open. There's only really one other thing that the valve does other than power. Pressure. Yep. What's the pressure? Water. Water, right? So no pressure. So if there's not enough, these valves need enough pressure to pop. So the, the way that they open is the water pressure comes in the back and opens. Now, if you've got zero pressure, this could be your problem. The client didn't turn the bull valve off, or their kids didn't turn the bull valve off, right? So that's one thing. The valves could be around the wrong way. So if you put a valve in backwards, it won't open. And that's pressure again, or flow. Um, the flow control may have been turned down all the way, which is that on the top. I didn't talk about that before. Um, and they've, they've just crushed it to a point where the, the valves open, but there's no water flowing through, not enough for a sprinkler to pop up, so you don't know about it. What else with water? Um, or there's a blockage of some sort which has come through the water so if uh, the, the what is it all water now if they do a repair at, at the road um, they get lots of rubble inside the mains pipe and then that flushes through your system and you get some rocks usually it's in the last valve here they get in there and then there's it's blocking the water from moving through the valve won't open anyone else got any idea have I missed anything won't open that's probably it all right so won't close so the system's on, why would it not close? Do it? Yep, so definitely debris. Now, with a solenoid valve, it's nothing much can go wrong with them, but they do have sensitive areas. So you could have a small amount of dirt in there or on the coil that stops the coil from actually simulate, like stopping from closing and dropping down, and it just won't close. You could also have a rock inside the, under the diaphragm that's stopping the diaphragm from closing. Ideally, you wanna check that first, right? Because that's just screwing that off. You're not getting tools out of your car. You're not opening valves up. As soon as you take the top of this diaphragm off, you're a half an hour, right? So you're taking that off, you're taking that out, and you're having a look. Now, that dirt may have created damage and it might have actually torn the diaphragm. That's a trip to an irrigation shop or hopefully you've got one of these on board. You can replace the diaphragm quite easily. All you're doing is screwing the, those eight screws out, taking this apart. Have you done this? Have you done like repairs? Yep. Anyone else? Yep. Yep. I'm wasting my time. Oh, here you go. Here we go. So you basically undo these, take that off. That's the base of a solenoid valve. The good thing about solenoid valves that are in the ground is the bit that's in the ground doesn't change, right? So there's nothing, there, this is a solid piece of plastic with no moving parts. So provided that the manufacturer still makes that valve, in most cases you could go buy the valve, take that bit from a new valve and screw it onto the old bit of the old valve. Unless this has been melted or warped or driven over by an excavator, you're pretty good. You're gonna put that back on and you're gonna be fine. So um, these as well, like, I think the key is knowing about it, but not necessarily needing to know how to do it. So this would be on YouTube, how to replace a diaphragm on a Rainbird DVF. And there'd be a two minute video of someone just unscrewing it, and then you can watch it and go, oh, no shit, okay, I just gotta make sure 
that's that way and that I don't lose that spring and that I put the screws back in that pattern and then I tighten them up this way and then I test it that way. So it's a pretty easy fix and none of this is that hard. It's just if you can't troubleshoot down to what it is, you're not gonna be able to fix it. So won't close anything else that would stop a valve from closing in anyone's minds. This is a bit harder. So obviously, We've done debris. We talked up here about water. The valves have to have water actively flowing through them to close. So if there's not enough flow or pressure, they won't close. If there's a rock or something stuck in there stopping it from closing, it won't close. And then the power. It might, it might be on, on purpose. The client might have rang you and said that it's watering because there's water everywhere because everyone's dramatic and it's just because it's Monday morning and it's when it's meant to water. So that would be something to check. Um, I should have a cheat sheet for this because I don't remember them all. That's probably it. So a valve not closing is probably more common than a valve not opening. You're not gonna get phone calls from clients for the valve not opening until the garden's dead. Valve not closing, the garden's flooding and there's water everywhere. So. Ideally, that's just, hey client, please turn bull valve off. You know where it is, it's in the green box next to the tree, they turn it off and then you can go deal with it later. Um, valve not opening, obviously, it depends on how hot it is. It's probably 42 that day. So it's time to go see your client. Um, what else could there be? There's a, there's a bleed screw here. That screw there. They use that to bleed water out the top of here. So that screw there. When you unscrew that screw, water squirts out. That'll turn the valve on. So you can actually turn a solenoid valve on manually by turning the coil a quarter turn and it simulates the electrical lift of the pin. Taking that bleed screw out will do the same thing. If the bleed screw is not in properly or you've lost it or you've threaded it or whatever, it'll think that it's still open and it will just keep running. So it could be that that bleed screw has been taken. That's a, that's a very, like a child has been in a valve box and started unscrewing things and that could be the problem. So that's probably it. The valves are around the right way. They're wired up properly. There's no debris in them um, and they've got enough flow. They should be fine. So that's them. Now, troubleshooting. I'm not going to go too much into this. I've put it in here. I'm, I mean, you guys talked before about repairing PVC. Um, obviously, does any, I mean, does anyone want me to talk through repairing poly pipe, blue line or PVC? Like, obviously, if you've got a, a piercing in it, how to put a joiner in, have you, have you, have you all done that? Like, so 19 mil drip tube. Obviously, PV, I'll just go about, so poly pipe, easy. You buy a 19 mil joiner or whatever, you cut it, bend it up, put it in, put your clamps on, it's fixed. If you're trying to repair PVC, it's important to remember that stormwater glue is not PVC glue. So the blue glue that you get to build a stormwater system is not mains pressure glue. So on a golf course, you'd probably be using green glue or clear green glue or high pressure green, green Jesus, high pressure green glue. We do a, a quick set green glue, which is set to mains within about 20 minutes. I don't know, are you using that? Only in winter, because yeah. it sets too quick in summer? Yeah. So that, the green glue that I'm referring to is quick. Like if you're, like I used to build my manifolds out of the green glue and it's like, and it's dry. You gotta be really quick. The green glue that you use as a standard green glue is 24 hours to mains. And it depends on what's going on. So obviously in a, in a golf course situation, they might need water back on because there's a tournament or there's in general a membership that have an opinion about everything. You guys don't need to comment on that. <laughs> The green glue, the normal mains pressure green glue, this is a 24, so you do not disturb for five minutes, 24 hours for curing, um, hold in position for 30 seconds. This glue, you need to get your shit together in about 10 seconds and it's dry, right? It is, and I'm not, I know that sounds dramatic, like to the point where they're not using it if it's too hot. So I think they say anything above 30 degrees Celsius and it's, you don't want to. We use it in winter only because the other glue is yeah, so that won't set. The other thing with this one is you can use it when the pipe's slightly wet. Obviously, you don't want it to be wet, wet. But yeah, so that you're saying that that won't even set. Uh, only from time to time. Like yeah. We never, normally never have an issue. Yeah. We actually use the red. Yeah. The primer. Yeah. Also the red. Yeah. The, yep. So they're primers. Yeah. 
sorry, and then we just... And then you use them? Yeah. In the quick set. Yep. Set too quick for yep. the dogs the other thing as well, for a golf course, they're playing with 40 mil probably as their smallest in PVC and up to kind of 100. I'm only, my experience is with 25 mil PVC. So putting a little bit of glue onto a piece of pipe that big is a dramatic difference to trying to get a 40 mil fitting completely and evenly. Like your glue's dry before you've even finished evenly spreading it. But if you've got a situation where there's PVC broken and it's at a house and you need to go and they need to water on Saturday, that, that's your, these are your glues. They'll dry really quickly and they're back to mains pressure within about 15 minutes. Yeah. Um, what does this say? Allow for two minutes. Good handling strength at 10. Depends on the size of the pipe. So yeah, like really quick. Anyway, if you're doing PVC repairs, you can get telescopic repair couplings, which will move out to fit PVC. Obviously you can't bend PVC up like you can with poly and blue line. Uh, poly and blue line. When, with a telescopic repair coupling, if you are using them, and this might be something you don't know, you need to have them fully extended. So you need to make sure you're cutting the PVC gap to fully extend the, 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 the join. Um, some people might just fit them in the hole just. You don't want them to have that play. You want them to be fully extended and they, they're working properly. Um, there's also telescopic repair couplings and then there's telescopic repair couplings. So there's a flow span double O-ring that we stock and a standard. One of them is mains pressure rated and the other one you'll have problems with on mains. Um, I think that's probably it. I don't want to keep you here unnecessarily. Obviously, there's another 25 minutes to go, um, which could give you some time to study for your tests that you guys are having, which you don't know about. All right. Um, so you're welcome to stay and ask me any questions you've got. I do thank you for coming. I know that it may not have been your choice, so I thank you for being polite and listening to my presentation. We do have an advanced training session coming. We, we always, we'll just keep rolling them, so I'll communicate that through however you got here. Um, and we're looking to do a controller programming one at some point. Um, I'm not sure when that'll be. Um, if anything does come up, uh, I'm pretty easy to find through Instagram if you need to ask me any questions. Uh, and yeah, other than that, stay around, help yourself to the drinks. I'll be here till four, so if you've got any more questions, reach out. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.